Say I started grading the first assignment, but I haven't been making very fast progress. But I hope to get it back soon. Uh, um, okay. So this time we're talking about this essay, The Poet, which is the first essay of the second series. First series was published in 1841, and the second series published in 1844. Um, so not that far apart, but um, it seems like we won't see it that much in the poet, but experience. He seemed Emerson seems to have changed in some certain ways before uh, um, he wrote experience. Uh, I mean, I'm not the first one to point this out. This is kind of well known uh, thing that there seems to be a change there, and possibly because of what he mentions near the beginning of experience about the death of his son. Um, Waldo. Uh, but anyway, so I'll, maybe I'll say more about that next week. Um, but actually, um, this time uh, I'm talking about certain things that, that seem to come up almost, at least not inconsistently. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, if it wasn't consistent, we, we shouldn't be surprised, right? But th certain things that seem to come up in similar ways in self-reliance and the poet. So the thing I didn't really get to at that end last time about um, um, Emerson's disagreement or anyway clear difference between Emerson and Coleridge as far as religion is concerned, um, that is, I think, is somehow tied to a disagreement or a difference in the way they see symbols. Um, so, um, and by the way, I should say, uh, so Emerson's first, yes, I think of this as a book. I just, I saw it, I don't know if it was published. I thought it was published as a monograph in 1836, Nature, his first major work. So um, not to be confused with, in the second series, there's an essay called Nature. <laughs> so there's two things he wrote called Nature. But the first one, which is this book that he published in 1836, I feel like is actually a lot closer to Coleridge. Um, so, I mean, if this were a course all about Coleridge and Emerson, it would definitely would do that and try to figure out what happened here. But of course, there's no time for that. So, um, but uh, um, in these essays, both self-reliance and the poet, and of course, the poet um, among other things is all about symbolism symbolism and symbols um, um, and it, there seems to be a uh, important difference between the way I mean, there seems to be enough similarity that you compare them. <laughs> They're talking about the same issues, but nevertheless, there's an important difference between the way Coleridge and Emerson understand symbols. So remember what I said about um, Coleridge on symbolism, and especially on religious symbolism, um, that 
you know, rationalist religious figures and Coleridge, like subject, of course, to what he thinks reason means, uh, is a rationalist religious thinker, right? He's trying to say that um, the core beliefs of Christianity as he understands it are the same as the, um, well, he says they are reason itself or something like that, right? So, um, so rationalist religious thinkers uh, will tend to account for the, the great variety of different religions by saying that um, um, that the kind of outward form of a religion, which includes like stories, you know, myths, uh, rituals, and also like the religion as a political institution, um, that, that that whole outward form of the religion is, is, a, is a symbolic version of a philosophical truth. Right, so there's this rational philosophical truth. And then it's symbolized by the religion. Um, and the reason, therefore, there can be many true religions because the same truth can be symbolized in many different ways. Right, so as I said, that is like a uh, medieval uh, proponent of this view is Al-Farabi, um, but it's, I mean, it's also pretty much Kant's understanding, at least if I understand Kant correctly. Um, so, um, and I mean, these, these symbols are important, according to these thinkers, because not everyone has direct access to the philosophical truth, right? So uh, like, this is how this philosophical truth can be made available to the masses, to the, right? Um, so, Coleridge, uh, as I was claiming about Coleridge that he agrees with this up to a point, uh, but then he um, he denies that in the case of the right kind of symbol, that this relationship is actually arbitrary, or that you can have many different symbols of the same truth. Um, right? He says. That applies to, um, so to speak, dead symbols as opposed to living symbols, right? Remember that thing about the living words? Um, living symbols are not arbitrary. God speaks in living words. Um, and remember, he, he interprets that weird vision in Ezekiel. I'm not sure if you seriously proposing this as an interpretation of that passage, or it's just using it, but it's actually, that's interesting because I would get into the question of what kind of symbol he's using Ezekiel for. But anyway, um, right, the, you know, where Ezekiel sees these creatures moving around and there's these wheels that move around with the creatures and he says the soul of the living creatures was in the wheels. Um, right, so Coleridge says, you know, symbols are like the wheels of what they symbolize of ideas or meanings or whatever, but they're living wheels. They're not just arbitrary wheels that you could tack on. Um, right, so therefore, um, there's only one true symbol of, uh, of the highest rational truth, and that is uh, Anglicanism, <laughs> I guess. Or, I mean, that's not, that's not what he says. He says the things that the early reformers agreed on. 
Um, okay, so um, so Emerson. Certainly, I guess, by the way, maybe I should say one other thing here, which is that although Cullerton talk, doesn't talk about this in the passages we read, and he must talk about it somewhere, but I can't remember him talking about it. Um, this must somehow also, you know, so I explained how it plays into Coleridge's understanding of grace and stuff like that. But this must somehow play into his understanding of incarnation also, right? Like how it is that a single human being is the son of God, as opposed to just like godly or something like that, right? But no, there's, there could be one uh, sensible representation of God, so to speak, that's not just a representation, but is the proper, right? Like that's the body God is incarnated, something like that. So and like I said, I don't know a place where Coleridge works that out in detail, but it does make sense that he's um, thinking something like that, which is why he um, denies that Unitarianism is Christianity because Unitarianism denies the divinity of Jesus. Um, so, uh, uh, so, and I mentioned that here because, as I said before, Emerson started off as a Unitarian minister. That was the conservative place that he started with, and then he moved away from that. Um, so, um, um, and he didn't move in the direction of Coleridge. He moved, at least apparently, so to speak, farther away, right? Like farther away from established religion and uh, orthodox views. Um, but, uh, but he did it in part by using some things that he found in college. Um, and I think that uh, seems to have been true for the New England transcendentalists in general, that they, they were using certain things they found in Coleridge and Schelling and other places like that, but they were definitely using it for their own purposes. So, um, so therefore, like, it's not surprising to find that in some way, Emerson is really close to Coleridge on this issue, but then there's some kind of crucial difference that makes it come out meaning the opposite. <laughs> so, so he, I mean, how is he similar to Coleridge? Well, um, um, well, he certainly agrees, he certainly also makes a distinction between living and dead symbols. And, um, and he furthermore, I think, agrees with Coleridge that live symbols are somehow adapted to their meanings, whereas the dead symbols are arbitrary. Um, or just kind of tacked on to their meanings, right? So, um, like on page 28 in the poet, the bottom of page 28, the expression is organic or the new type which things themselves take when liberated. You know, actually, I mean, reading that now, that is connected to this, right? He's saying the expression is organic. 
So remember that organic, like organ means what it does <laughs> because um, uh, a living thing, the parts of a living thing are organs of its life, that is instruments, like tools of its soul to do what its soul does. Um, so, you know, um, when he's saying that the expression is organic, he means like um, the expression is animated by what it expresses. Um, it's made living by what it expresses. Um, the truth is, though, this quote, maybe I've taken a little out of context because in context, Kohler is saying something more complicated there, but maybe a simpler version of it is this quote I wrote down on page 15. Um, so here he's talking about the difference between quote unquote our poets, right, by which he means um, contemporary poets, his contemporaries. I, but I don't know if it actually necessarily includes every poet who's alive at the, at the same instant as Emerson, but it means the poets of our times, right? Like the poets of um, uh, the poets who don't belong to a different time. Whenever they happen to be alive, they belong to a different time or something like that. Anyway, whatever that means, these mean, these are poets who are not great poets. They're not the poets he's, although they may be perfectly talented, they're not the poets he's talking about in this essay. And he says, um, um, that the problem with these poets, or you can see the problem with them from the fact that for them, quote, the argument is secondary, the finish of the verses is primary. So by argument here, he means the like subject matter or the what the poem is about. This is kind of an old meaning of one of old meaning of the word argument. So um, the argument is secondary, the finish of the verses is primary, right? That is, these poets basically think, well, you know, what makes it a good poem is how well the, the, the verse is structured and, you know, uh, um, how good the images are, how strong, you know, how the meter works out, right, and all that stuff. And oh yeah, maybe the poem is about something interesting. <laughs> but that's secondary. I, you know, because I think, although he doesn't say this, I think they're thinking, because that could just as well be expressed in prose, probably more clearly, right? If you just want to say what the poem is about, you would, just, you would say it in prose. So they're thinking that the, the, what makes it poetry is that other stuff, that's primary. And then Emerson says, in reply to this, it is not meters, but a meter-making argument that makes a poem. A thought so passionate and alive that like the spirit of a plant or an animal, it has an architecture of its own and adorns nature with a new thing. Right, so the poem that the great poet would create, um, the poet who knows that the argument is primary, is the poem that the argument requires as its embodiment. Just as the spirit of a living thing, um, it's not, you know, like, the fact that a snail shell looks like this is not like a decoration. <laughs> that you could add on to a snail. <laughs> it's, this is the form that's required to live as a snail. If that makes sense. Okay, so um, 
So this this is this is the the architecture of the spirit of the snail. This is architecture, I guess, in the sense of like the art and science of designing the right building, right? So that the spirit of the snail contains this art or science of designing a snail. Um, and that's why the snail looks the way it does. Um, so Emerson is saying similarly, the poem that's written by the great poet would be um, the uh, the argument, the thought behind the poem is so passionate and alive that it has an architecture of its own and adorns nature with a new thing, right? Just the way the spirit of the snail does. So again, I think maybe, like I said, that quote maybe is a little bit clearer that Emerson is also saying that the right kind of symbols are living symbols. Um, so, and I mean, this does also mean that the symbol isn't arbitrary. Right, I mean, it's not it's not as if um, um, the same spirit of the snail we might call this the form of snail or something like that. It's not as if. This is one way that it can be expressed by a material thing, but you know, it can also be expressed like this. Right? So, again, this, you know, um, it's not like you could say, um, all right, you know, I'm really talented, I'm good at making beautiful forms. Let me make one and put the spirit of the snail into it. So, you know, I like this form, and now I'll put the spirit of the snail into it, and that will be a snail. No, that won't work, right? You have to let the spirit of the snail dictate what the form should be. So, um, so he also, I think, agrees with Coleridge that these living symbols are not arbitrary. But the difference is somehow is that somehow that's not supposed to mean that the symbols are non arbitrary, is not supposed to mean that the meanings and their symbols are permanently tied together one to one. And um, Coleridge definitely does mean that. And I think, you know, he's thinking of the rest of the text in Ezekiel, right? So this is, it's in Ezekiel chapter one, and this is verse 21. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood, and when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels, right? So as Ezekiel describes these wheels, whatever they are. <laughs> like things, maybe. It says they are under the creatures. There's a big description of the creatures too. They have four faces, and yeah, no, uh, no one really knows what this vision is. But, but I mean, for obvious reasons, people have been trying to figure out since forever, or like getting interpretations of it. So anyway, um, it, it doesn't end with the creatures. There's more stuff too. But never mind that. So right. So the the, the in the in the vision, these wheels, whatever they are. There's like, I guess, one wheel per creature, and whatever the creature does, the wheel also does. <laughs> right. So again, I mean, without trying to figure out what Ezekiel meant by this, or you know, whatever, um, it seems clear that if, if we interpret it in Coleridge's way, he's he's he likes that because it's it's saying that you can't just change symbols. Which 
again, if you think of religion as the symbol of the rational or philosophical truth or something like that, and you want to be um, um, orthodox and also um, conformist, right? So I talked about last time about what, you know, conformity means literally and what Emerson is doing with it in that sentence. But, um, but as Emerson, Emerson is also thinking about this, that in the context of um, English religion, right, there's a distinction between conformist and nonconformist. A conformist is someone who um, goes to the established church and participates in the established church, whatever their beliefs may be. Uh, if they if they don't believe in it somehow, they keep that to themselves and they take the oath that they're required to take and whatever. Um, whereas a nonconformist is says, someone who says, "No, my conscience is against it," and then and then, you know they don't go to the established church. They refuse to take the oath, and then at least uh, to begin with, that meant they were excluded from public office and all kinds of consequences. So. Um, so Coleridge is definitely a conformist and thinks you should be a conformist, and, but he thinks you should be a conformist because at least he's arguing that the established religion is the right one. <laughs> so, um, um, so all of that, clearly Emerson is not on board. <laughs> Um, so, um, so how can that be? Well, I mean, I guess at the simplest level, you can explain it by what Emerson says on page 10. Right? In other words, how is it that the demand for living symbols can be a demand for nonconformism rather than for conformism? So, um, Right. Um, you, so the right before the 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 well, I'll just start reading here. Even the poets are contented with a civil and conformed manner of living, and to write poems from fancy at a safe distance from their own experience. But the highest minds of the world have never ceased to explore the double meaning. Or shall I say the quadruple or centuple or much more manifold meaning of every sensuous fact? Right? So every sensuous fact, Emerson is saying, um, is it's not that the same truth has many like interchangeable sensible representations. Rather, it's that every sensible fact is. Um, the symbol of many different truths. Um, and moreover, I mean, so so far we don't understand how like how this is getting beyond Coleridge, right? But I think this is the key part. Moreover, these many meetings are not just an array of options where like you could use the symbol to mean this, or you could use the symbol to mean this, or you could use it to mean this. Um, 
the symbol has a kind of natural progress from one meaning to another. So that um, at least one way to kill the symbol, to make it no longer living, is to try to fix it to one meaning. Because uh, after a while, that won't be the right meaning anymore. And now you are using it arbitrarily, basically. Right? That is, the, the living connection between the meaning and the symbol is gone. Because the symbol has moved on to something else somehow. Yeah. So out of this multiple representation, like I mean multiple ideas represented by the same single thing. Bridges those multiple ideas to one and then the symbol is becoming dead. Well it's it, it becomes dead because um there's one that's right now, so to speak. <laughs> Um, but you can't hold on to it. Tomorrow, another one will be right. So if you try to hold on to it, so in other words, rather than drawing it like this, you should draw it like this, sort of. The living symbol is one that kind of like moves through the field of meaning. And when you try to stop it, but it's like the meaning moves on and you're, you're just left holding a dead symbol. Um, so that symbol doesn't even represent one idea, right? Well, it doesn't represent it in the right way. I mean, you're still using it to represent that idea, but it no, but it's now it no longer has that living connection to it, right? It's... Um, um, yeah, okay, I think, so, um, right, so he talks about this, especially around page 37, um, says, But the quality of the imagination is to flow and not to freeze. The poet did not stop at the color or the form, but read their meaning. Neither may he rest in this meaning, but he makes the same objects exponents of his new thought. <laughs> so that's what I was just talking about. And then he says, here is the difference betwixt the poet and the mystic, that the last, that is the mystic, nails a symbol to one sense, which was a true sense for a moment, but soon becomes old and false. For all symbols are fluxional, all language is vehicular and transitive, and as good as ferries and horses are for conveyance, not as farms and houses are for homestead. <laughs> um, um, I mean, I guess in some way, although I don't know if he's thinking about this, but in some way Emerson could offer a counter interpretation of Ezekiel's vision and say that, you know, the important thing is that the creatures never stop moving. <laughs> um, and that the creatures and the wheels symbolize the way, you know, uh, the, the right symbol is always on the move. You can't be nailed down. But in any case, um, so and as an example of someone who was a mystic and tried to nail this stuff down, he mentions, where is this? Oh, it's on the bottom of page 30. Oh, here he is. Yeah, our friend Jakob Berna, or he calls him Jacob Bayman. <laughs> but, um, 
I guess there's different forms of engineering, right? You know, He mentions him as an example of a mystic who gets like really excited about the exact symbols that have worked for him and then tries to make them always work for everyone. Um, and he says, The mystic must steadily, must be steadily told. All that you say is just as true without the tedious use of that symbol as with it. Let us have a little algebra instead of this trite rhetoric, universal signs instead of these village symbols, and we shall both be gainers. That is, I guess what that means is, actually, I'm not 100% sure what it means, not surprisingly, <laughs> but, um, but I think what he means is, if you're not going to be a poet, you should be a scientist, basically, right? That is, like, if you're going to try to use this trite symbol to express a truth and keep it working always, don't use that kind of symbol. Let's have a little algebra. <laughs> meaning describe it abstractly, something like that. I think that's what he means. I'm not completely sure though. Maybe he means that great poets' use of symbols is like algebra. <laughs> it depends how he thinks algebra works, which is a very interesting job. But like, you know, um, ever since the invention of algebra, philosophers have been trying to understand uh, you know, how this is a name of a number, or what is it, or what is it? <laughs> right. um, so uh, they come up with some pretty different understandings. And even, so even though a lot of philosophers, and especially I think in the well, no, also 20th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, keep mentioning algebra um, and how words are like algebra or should be like algebra. They all mean different things because they all have a different understanding of how algebra works. All right, anyway, I don't know of any other way, evidence for what Emerson thought about algebra. So, yeah. So the mystic sort of Here's the symbol by holding on to it for too long and just apply it universally. Yeah, right. And the, and the point about algebra is, I think, that somehow there is a kind of language or a kind of expression that's okay to use universally rather than these village symbols. And if you're, you know, so if you're going to do what the mystic wants to do, don't do it with poetic symbols that you kill, do it with this other use of language. I think that's what he means, but I'm really not sure. I mean, there's certainly no place where Emerson writes that I know of, where Emerson writes in a different mode. Although he, I mean, he likes scientists and he, you know, often uses his long, name dropping lists. <laughs> There's often a lot of scientists in there, right? Like Newton, Galileo, or whatever. Uh, so yeah, he may be thinking about the use of language in science. Um, anyway, in any case, getting back to um, yeah, the truth is it would be really nice if I could figure out what Emerson thinks about that. Another chance to love for that. Anyway, <laughs> getting back to, to the kind of poetic symbols we're talking about. So, um, so how does it come about? Like, um, how does Emerson come to see the relationship between a living symbol and its meaning? 
so differently from the way Coleridge does, almost the opposite way, right? Because again, Coleridge is thinking it's, you know, it's not arbitrary because they're essentially connected and they have to always be together. And Emerson is thinking um, it's not arbitrary because I um, let the symbol change as the you know as the as the meaning requires or something like that. Um, so I think that partly it actually has to do with um, a different understanding of life or of the relationship between the soul and the body. Um, I guess I can. Um, that, uh, and it's actually an ancient difference. Um, it's so I think I quoted this before, but I'm going to write it up now. This is Aristotle's definition of the soul. Soul is. First entelechy of a natural now entelechy is, is not a normal word, obviously. Uh, it's it's I mean the word that Aristotle uses is entelecheia, so it's I mean I'm basically just writing it in English. <laughs> Um, um, it, it means something like perfection or actuality um, as opposed to potentiality or some combination of those things, something like that. Um, and uh, by the way, this is in Dianima. So, um, um, so, uh, so the soul is, and the reason he says first is complicated. I won't talk about that. There's more than one actuality or an intelligence of a given potentiality, but in any case, so the soul is the first actuality of a natural organic body. And um, so the basic interpretive question, or at least one of the basic interpretive questions about this is, um, Um, is the body organic and natural because it has a soul? Or is the definition, does the definition of the soul rely on some kind of prior characterization of this body as natural and organic? Um, so, right, I mean, questions like Aristotle's definitions almost always raise questions like it's, uh, I mean, they're always complicated like this. They're always complicated like this. Why? Because Aristotle is thinking, if, every time he gives a simple definition, he's imagining Socrates showing up and being like, oh, so you think it means this, do you? Blah, 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 and then you contradict yourself, right? So there's always like all kinds of qualifications and whatever to make sure that you won't get away with that. So, but then that always raises this type of interpretive questions. So in this case, um, there's a difference between a peripatetic interpretation and the neoplatonic interpretation, or neoplatonist. And the peripatetic explanation is probably like if 
if you've heard about this definition before, is probably um, the one you're more likely to be familiar with. It's more like a modern understanding of what Aristotle means. Um, so although that that keeps changing too, of course. But um, but so the peripatetic explanation basically is that um, a body is organic because um, um, uh, I guess I put it this way, the organicness and naturalness of the body are it's having a soul. These aren't two different things about it. So it's the first of those two alternatives I was talking about, right? It's not like a body is natural and organic. That, those are two things I'm saying about it. And then also it has this entelechy, which is its soul. It's, you know, the, the soul of the body is its being natural and organic. Um, So this means this understanding, I don't know how to, how to write this and draw it, but <laughs> um, on this understanding, it doesn't make sense to talk about separating the soul from the body or putting it in a different body, right? The soul is the fact that the body has a certain organization, basically. Saying this body is animate is just another way of saying it has an organized natural form. Um, whereas the Neoplatonist understanding of this is that um, the body, first of all, has a nature, and second of all, has an organicness. And somehow the soul is related to that. So this is the body. Right, so I mean, you can read Neoplatonist, many of the uh, important commentators, all of the important commentators on Aristotle from late antiquity were Neoplatonists. So you can read their commentaries on Dianema 2.1, and this, this is what they talk about, how like the um, soul is one thing, and then uh, the soul is connected to this body that has this property of being natural and organic. Um, so on this understanding, it does make sense to ask, um, well, okay, um, what about the soul by itself without the body? And it even makes sense to say, could the soul go into a new body? Well, so as you know, Plato talks about souls. I mean, whether he means that literally or not is a good question about Plato, right? But Plato talks about souls transmigrating from one, one body to another, right? Like, you know, uh, depending on what you did in this life, you'll be born as a different kind of animal next time, stuff like that, right? So, um, uh, so Neoplatonists, I mean, I guess maybe I should say something about who the Neoplatonists were, um, right? Neo, they didn't call themselves Neoplatonists, they call themselves Platonists. <laughs> but we call them Neoplatonists because, um, so this school was founded by Plotinus in, I think third century probably, that is AD, somewhere around there. And uh, what's a hundred years there, one way or the other. And, um, um, and uh, so Plotinus sees himself as a follower of Plato, but um, he 
he's constantly reading Plato from Aristotle. He doesn't usually mention Aristotle, but like if you read the Aeneids, which is Plotinus's work, it's you know like terminology is all Aristotelian and questions and the answers that we put are all based on Aristotle, and also in many times the interpretation of Plato, like the idea of what Plato's position is, is comes from Aristotle's reports about what Plato thought. <laughs> okay. So he's a kind of Aristotelian Platonist, and his followers, um, if anything, that was more true of his followers. As time went on, his followers started arguing that there wasn't really a disagreement between Aristotle and Plato, that they just expressed Things differently, or something like that. So they like tried to draw them closer and closer together. Um, and Emerson, in this essay, uh, twice mentions Proclus twice and Geographus once. These are important later neoplatonists. Um, so Emerson is definitely at least portraying himself as a serious student of this school. <laughs> um, you know, how much time he actually, these people um, wrote a ton of stuff. And because the Byzantines were Platonists, they he transmitted all of it. It all survived. This is huge <laughs> reams of Neoplatonist writing from late antiquity, where it's like other people like Epicurus and whatever are lost. So anyway, like whether Emerson really spent a lot of time reading this stuff, I don't know, but um, he, he at least he has some kind of serious relationship to it. Um, and um, And so there's a general framework. This is supposed to say what here is. Especially on the recording, it's probably not really good. Well. Anyway, um, there's kind of a general framework that the Neoplatonists use to fit this soul body relationship into. And they do it by adding two causes to the Aristotelian list of four causes. So um, the you know the normal Aristotelian list of causes is and believe it or not, this actually is relevant to Emerson when I'm doing that. Material, formal, efficient, final. So, like, if you look at the peripatetic understanding of this definition, a living thing is something where the soul is its form. So that's they understood entelechy here to be the same as form. The soul is the, but it's it's not a platonic form, obviously, it's an imminent form. So the soul is the formal cause of this thing. But um the material that the body is made out of is the material cause of the thing. So at least like the proximate material cause is the flesh and blood and whatever. Um, and um, the soul is also the efficient and the final cause of the thing, right? Because the soul is what makes it move, but it makes it move for the sake of maintaining itself as the form. Um, and so everything in the, in the peripatetic, and I guess I should say peripatetic means, right, Aristotle's own school call themselves the peripatetics. So, so when I say peripatetics, I mean people who were followers of Aristotle who were, didn't see themselves as followers of Plato, essentially, right? So the peripatetic view, you know, explains what a living thing is using this list of four causes. But the Neoplatonists add two other causes, the paradigmatic cause and 
an organic cause. Sometimes you see this called instrumental cause, right? Because um, organon is getting translated as instrument, which is a correct um, translation, except I think you lose the connection with this, <laughs> right? Because no one translates this as instrumental. <laughs> So, um, so the way neoplatonists understand a living thing is, well, so the, the, what is the paradigmat paradigmatic cause and the organic cause in general? So the way neoplatonists understand this, um, the paradigmatic cause is something at a higher level of being. Like for example, a platonic form. And, Something at a lower level of being is like an image of it. So this is the paradigmatic cause of this. It's not the efficient cause, right? The efficient cause might be something that's pushing it, right? Um, it's not the formal cause in Aristotle's sense because the formal cause is the imminent form of the thing. This is something else. That's the, and this something else doesn't depend on this for its existence, right? It's a higher level of being. This like emanates out of it. So, um, so that's the paradigmatic cause. And then the organic cause is the, um, it's like the principal imminence in this lower thing that allows it to be the image of the higher one. So there's something in the lower thing, there's an aspect of it that um, like uh, makes it fit to be an image of this. So in the case of a thing in the realm of nature, so there's like, this is based on something Socrates says in the laws, this three part division here, this intellect, soul, nature. So like soul is the realm above nature, the nature is the lowest realm. Above intellect, there's like, one beyond being. And according to Proclus and later people, they don't extend up here and it's more complicated. But anyway, so um, so in the case of nature, the paradigmatic cause is, this is the realm of soul, the paradigmatic cause is the soul of the living thing and the organic cause. So this is a natural body. That is, it has a nature. It's a, um, it's a particular manifestation of the general hypostasis nature. <laughs> it's a natural body, but it has some kind of principle in it that makes it fit to be the ex expression of this soul, and that's the organic cause. Right? And that's how they're interpreting this definition. The soul is the first intelligent and natural organic body. This is a natural body that has this organic cause in it. And the soul is its intelligent, meaning its paradigmatic thoughts. Yeah. Why is not the material cause, you know, why the material makeup of the, the body? Why isn't it enough? Why do we need to introduce a new cause? Because I get the paradigmatic one, so oh, oh, I, I see. don't know why. And I understand it's like because it is paradigmatic that we need an organic, but why? Um, Did they just like make the material work in this, this way? I mean, so their organic cause is an imminent cause, 
meaning, unlike the paradigmatic cause, it can't be separated off. Or this, you know, in general, in in things in general, these two causes are imminent and these two are transient. In living things, that's different because they contain their own final and efficient cause, right? But in general, the efficient cause is something outside, and the final cause is an end that's outside the thing, whereas so these are imminent. So like imminent causes can't be taken out of the thing. Um, so like, so the organic cause is not um, an, like extra part of the thing, so to speak, but it's a different aspect of it. It's the respect in which it aims back up at its source or something like that. So like when you say, why do we need something extra? It's not really something extra. It's like the same thing considered in a different respect or something like that. Um, I don't know, that's the best I can say. This, I mean, I did want to teach a course about progress, which <laughs> was a grad seminar about progress. That was interesting, but I'm not going to try to do that now. So, I, so anyway, but um, like having said all this, like the, the reason I brought this all in is because it seems like Emerson really is thinking about it. Um, He's thinking of the soul as something higher than the body um, and separable from the body, but it never, but on the other hand, as a kind of paradigm of which the body is a copy. And he's thinking about this not, um, I mean, I guess when I say he's thinking about this, How is he using this? I don't think, I mean, I don't really think this about Plato either. The Neoplatonists are a different matter. Some of them were into magic and stuff. <laughs> like, um, like theurgy, you know, like getting things to happen, like manipulating the gods and upper realm, you know, stuff like that. But I think for Emerson and Plato, this is, itself a kind of symbol. And that makes it confusing, but it's, you know, I mean, this is a way of thinking about and talking about life for a certain purpose, right? It's not for the purpose of like, um, um, I don't know how to put what the alternative would be, but it's just like, it's not for the purpose of flatly telling you, oh yeah, there's different levels of reality and there's things in here that, you know, and you, you could be born transmigrated to a frog and, right, like as a bunch of facts. <laughs> it's a way of um, talking about how the world depends on its meaning. But it's, but it's a, it's a way that's different from this way and also different from, um, a kind of uh, Cartesian slash Lockean way of thinking about it, which um, which Emerson refers to. This is back on page ten. But it's the place he, where he says that according to our philosophy, we are like um, pans, our bodies are like pans that you carry a fire around. Like that's the relationship between body and soul, according to our philosophy. So that's neither of these, right? Like that's like saying the body and the soul are just two completely different things that but I mean, it's still a way of understanding the body as a kind of organ instrument of the soul. But now it's 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 like a watch, which is how Descartes describes it. It's like an instrument that we go by itself once it's wound up. Um, 
It doesn't require my soul to be what it is. And on the other hand, although it's useful, I don't require it to be what I am either. That is, my soul doesn't require it to be what it is either. It's just, it so happens that right now the soul is being carried around this watch. <laughs> right. So, um, so like these are two alternatives, but this is a third alternative. And Emerson is glomming onto this one. Yeah. You said that the, this is like a symbol for how we vibrate. Is that between the, the system that they devised? The system that Plato came up with this symbol that should be used for understanding life. I mean, is then that might be a great point between Coleridge and Emerson. It is not to be taken as religion, the system. Well, it is religion. I mean, yeah, I mean. <laughs> It's um, I mean, and Coleridge and Emerson agree about this, right? Like religion is a system of symbols that is, you know, um, somehow used for us to have the right relationship between our will and our intellect and um, um, to have self-consciousness in the, in the true sense and um, to uh, be able to produce poetry and art and be moral and all that, right? Like it's, um, and it's, and it's necessary. <laughs> You know, so I mean, that's what religion is, I guess. But the only thing I'm saying that's strange here is that the very apparatus, but I mean, I, but if you think about it, I think it would be strange if it were otherwise. The very apparatus that Emerson is using to explain what a symbol is and how symbols can do this is itself. Um, um, a particular symbol of that, or is itself being used as a symbol of, of, of some meaning? Um, it's not being said from some other point of view. It's not, I guess, you know, um, if you read it, Proclus, by the way, Proclus also wrote a commentary on the first book of Euclid's Elements. He was very interested in mathematics, geometry. So, um, you know, if you read some of these people, they do sound a little bit like a little algebra, <laughs> right? They are like technical and abstract. And so, but Emerson doesn't sound like that. Um, Emerson, this kind of writing, if you accept that all the words are technical terms and you're not going to be able to translate them into some word that, you know, non technical word that gives the same meaning, this like, kind of writing is very easy to translate. Because it's universal symbols. Or universal science like like algebra, but Emerson, although Nietzsche read Emerson in German, so it's possible to translate. Um, clearly, is the kind of writing that would be extremely difficult to translate. He is using symbols, and he doesn't his his sound doesn't change when he talks about this. In fact, like. I have to point out that he's using this word, he's using this word, and whatever, to, to even show that he's alluding to it. I mean, it's not a secret, he does mention them, but um, I don't know. I don't know how many of that helps. I mean, it's a good question. <laughs> it's, 
it's a good question and I raised it myself by saying, you know, I could have just gone ahead and said, you know, oh, so Emerson is really a neoplatonist. Um, this is what he thinks, you know, you know, he thinks that the one being one being, and I mean, he does say stuff like that in this essay, right? Like he talks about, actually, I was about to read this on the, on page 19 where he quotes Spencer. Is that, is that Edward Spencer? Who is that Spencer? I don't know. It sounds <laughs> like from Neo Darwinist or something. I don't know. Neo Darwinist. It was a bit strange. I, you know, I meant to look this up in my. I have a like, you know, um, modern annotated edition that probably has a footnote. And I didn't get to it, but. Um, I can tell you next time which Spencer this is. It doesn't sound Darwinist. Associate Darwinist a bit, no? I've never heard of something else. Well, I guess I kind of see why you're saying that, but um, I mean, so, right, so what Spencer's, whichever Spencer this is, <laughs> kind of embarrassing, I should know, but I don't. Anyway, um, so every spirit, um, I don't, we don't know what comes before this, right? Like just as blah, 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 so every spirit as it is more pure and half in it, the more of heavenly light, so with the fair, oh no, maybe these two so's go together. So every spirit as it is more pure and half in it the more of heavenly light. So with the fairer body doth produce to, doth produce to have it in, and it more fairly dight. Whatever that means. With cheerful grace and amiable sight. For of the soul the body form doth take. For soul is form and doth the body make. So I guess you're saying it's social Darwinist in the sense that you're saying like if someone is good looking, it's because they have a good soul and that's kind of mean. That social Darwinism is kind of mean. I mean, I don't know if there's a closer connection between this and social Darwinism than that. Yeah. So um, um So like a lot of people say things like that, like this, and continue to say things like this. And they'll say, you know, of course, well, that is at least hopefully, they don't mean that like the um, person on the cover of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue has the best soul, right? They, but, but they do mean that somehow like a kind of beauty shines of, of people who have good souls, right? So, uh, I mean, maybe when you put it that way, it doesn't sound so mean, but in any case, what I want to focus on, what I wanted to focus on here is, first of all, that, that Spencer is expressing this view for soul is form and doth the body make, but it's, so it's like that thing with the snail, but like it's coming from outside and making the body using its architecture, as opposed to the peripatetics who would be saying that um, the body makes, the, the soul makes the body in the sense that the soul uh, um, uh, is the fact that the body is the kind of body it is or something like that. So, um, but then uh, right, right after that, Emerson says, here we find ourselves suddenly not in a critical speculation, but in a holy place. Now we find ourselves, so we'll see next time um, that experience starts off with this question, where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves, that can be an expression for um, reflection, transcendental reflection coming to self-consciousness, we find ourselves suddenly 
not in a critical speculation. That is not in Kantian philosophy, you might take this, but in a holy place and should go very warily and reverently. We stand before the secret of the world where being passes into appearance and unity into variety. Right, so, that, so that, the whole reason I went to that right now is because I was saying, yeah, Emerson does talk this way. Being into um, appearance and unity into variety, I mean, that's straight Platonism, right? And, and, that, and the thing he said at the beginning, um, right before, he talks about the pans and stuff. He says, there is no doctrine of form in our philosophy. Oh, here it is. It's on the very first page, page nine. There is no doctrine of forms in our philosophy. Doctrine of forms is Plato. <laughs> Saying our philosophies are not Platonists. And that's after that is when he says, we were put into our bodies as fire is put into a pan to be carried about. All right. Um, sorry, where was I? So, yeah, so I mean, I'm probably not putting it right. And probably because it's something I don't understand right. But I'm trying to say, yeah, I could have just said, this is what Emerson believes. If you want to know what Emerson believes, read progress or something like that. Similar to when I was in high school, there was an English teacher. Fortunately, I had the other English teacher. There was an English teacher who was kind of, <laughs> and among other things, she, was, she taught them that Emerson was in contact with extraterrestrials. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I could have offered a similar explanation. The reason Emerson sounds so weird is because he's been reading Proclus, and the, you know, the key to it is Proclus, right? Just like according to her, the key to it would be, you know, understanding that it's really code for the extraterrestrials and what they were doing. So, I mean, uh, but but I don't think that would be right. Um, because, like I said, it doesn't sound like these people. He's using them for something, but he's, uh, but he's doing his own thing with it. Um, um, okay, but like, given all that, there's something surprising in what he says next on page 10. Oh, right. No, it's next after what I was just reading. We were put into our bodies as fire is put into a pan to be carried about. But there is no accurate adjustment between the spirit and the organ, much less is the latter the germination of the former. So this is introducing something that isn't obviously part of this picture as I've drawn it so far. That, uh, what's this? Now, I mean, so in that sense, he's talking about what's missing in our philosophy. Therefore, this is what should be there, but it's missing, right? What's missing is that the organ is the germination of the spirit. Um, So germination means like the seed that something grows on it. And this seems to be backwards, right? Like are we saying the spirit grows out of the organ and the organ is the seed? 
and um, and in fact, you know, in other places, Emerson seems to say it in the right direction, right? like on page twenty-six. Um, this expression or meaning is not art, but a second nature grown out of the first as a leaf out of a tree. Wait, is that the right direction? <clears throat> yeah. Right, the naming of a thing, the expression, that's the symbol I take. Grows out of the thing, like a leaf out of the tree. So, the thing symbolized is the seed, so to speak. I mean, like calling it a tree, but the symbol grows out of it. But in that first place, it sounds like he's saying that the, the thing symbolized grows out of a symbol. Germination, organ is the germination of the spirit. But, you know, I mean, of course, although a tree grows out of a seed, um, it's also true that the seed grows out of the tree. <laughs> and I think that's what he's thinking, that, that the meaning in being expressed or in expressing itself has, so to speak, planted itself. And then, um, so, this experience or meaning, and it's kind of planted itself in the symbol, and then the symbol is growing back into it. Now, I mean, when I say it's growing back into itself again, I think what that means is, so the symbol is organ. Now, in that neoplatonist picture I drew, it seems simple that, that this this organicity of this thing just means that this thing, this symbol, is like a tool that this uses for its purposes. But what are its purposes? What does it use it for? So, um, so I think that the answer of our video Platonist and Emerson is that it uses it to that this thing will turn back and, and um, reflect back to its source. Well, actually, so actually, maybe this isn't what the Neoplatonists would say. Because the Neoplatonists would say that this higher level doesn't need this lower level. Although it doesn't. Yeah, I'm not sure. But anyway, what um, post Kantian idealists. inheriting some part of this Neoplatonist tradition would say is, like what Hegel would say is that this needs to be reflected back out of externality in order to know itself. 
That's what, so this is an organ. What is this an organ for? It's an organ of intellectual intuition. That is, it's an organ, it's like a way of seeing. It's a way for the spirit to see itself. Um, and the metaphor for that is planting and growing back. Or the symbol of that is planting and growing back. Um, but, um, but furthermore, and this is where something like Darwinism, not social Darwinism, but something like Darwin, but, I mean, it's not, Okay, so this is before Darwin. I mean, Darwin was alive. Uh, he'd already published The Voyage of the Beagle one or whatever. But it was before the origin of species. So, um, but, um, but the idea of evolution of species, not by natural selection, but evolution of species period was like everyone was talking about that. Um, so, um, so there is this idea floating around that species develop into higher forms. They and Emerson refers to this as metamorphosis, changing form. Right. So the so. When so part of I guess like the reason the metaphor is a is something a plant growing back from its seed rather than just reflection from a mirror is that we see there's some growth going on. This thing is becoming higher, and so when it grows back, this thing knows itself better. <laughs> Yeah. So just a quick question. In the first book, the bacteria nation, there was something that sounded like the organic host was missing. But I said that the body is not fit or skin or something. Right. So that was according to our philosophy. That is basically like according to Locke's philosophy, I think you could say, or Descartes' philosophy. Um, so, like Emerson, as I mean, part of what I'm, I'm trying to explain here is how Emerson and Coleridge are on the same side against this, or would think of themselves as being on the same side against this, right? So that the New England transcendentalists are very um, upset about the reigning empiricist philosophy, um, reigning in England. Basically, but in Scotland, in another form, that um, since America up to this point doesn't have much of its own philosophical school, it's also leaning in America. And they're looking to Coleridge and Germans, because France is also empiricist at this point, right? On the left or whatever. So, um, um, so they're looking to Coleridge and or the Germans. Um, just as Coleridge is looking at the Germans for something to aim against this. <laughs> so, yeah, so in our philosophy, the organic cause is missing. Either this way or this way. Because again, here the organ on our instrument is understood as something that um, would do what it does even if I weren't, wasn't there. And that's, you know, that's what Descartes says about the body. Um, that, and I mean, in the case of animal bodies, Descartes says that's all there that is, right? There's a mechanism, clockwork, that would keep working, uh, that, that, that keeps working without needing to be connected to a soul. And similarly, because our bodies also would keep working without being connected to a soul or mind. Well, yeah, I mean, then like, to go farther than that, get into the like, difficult Descartes interpretation. But that far, you know, that these are two different substances. And that, you know, and that, I guess 
What's revolutionary there in Descartes is not saying that the soul is a separate substance, because these people agree with that. That's a well-known doctrine, right? And even Aristotelians usually agree that the human soul has a separate and material part of it. But it's saying that the living body is a, is a separate substance. That's, no one says that before Descartes. The body would be what it is without the soul. All right, anyway, um, and that's so, yeah, so that, I hope that clears up what you're asking about. Um, ooh, I'm almost out of time. Um, so, um, and so, like, the fact that, that this, this symbol is developing or evolving or metamorphosizing is, um, I guess, it's not only that this thing therefore can understand itself better, but it's that what's missing, according to Schelling, from the, from the series of experiences in time is that, um, like, no one of them is fit as an image of the infinite until the artistic genius comes along and creates a finite image of the infinite. Um, but um, um, but this form that won't stay fixed but keeps evolving into another one. Um, Emerson says that is a fit symbol of the infinite. It's not self enclosed like this Aristotelian animal. It's always pointing on to something beyond itself. Um, and as he says on page 29, like the more metamorphosis of things into higher organic forms is their change into melodies. <laughs> so, meaning, I take it that this relation is like a fit image of this relation. Um, or as he also says, this is on page 25, all the facts of the animal economy, sex, nutriment, gestation, birth, growth, are symbols of the passage of the world into the soul of man, to suffer there a change and reappear a new and higher fact. So the fact that organic nature in individuals and in species keeps changing is a symbol of the fact that the whole thing is a symbol. <laughs> um, okay, I'm out of time, but I wanted to say Yeah, I guess, well, okay. Here we'll get back to talk about the colossal symbol and self-reliance and stuff like that. But, but so um, um, what I can say in conclusion is that Emerson is saying to Coleridge, um, your symbols are dead symbols. They're symbols uh, in, that are somehow stuck in the past. Um, or they're stuck in the wrong kind of past, <laughs> right? Because there's one kind of past of symbols that, that's good. Every word was originally a poem, right? We want to get back to that, Emerson says. That's, I think, is kind of his justification of that like wordplay he does with taking words literally and stuff. But, but this kind of um, um, Coleridge's kind of search for the right symbol in the past. Let's use these words the way the original Anglican theologians used them, et cetera. That yields dead symbols. And, um, and, um, you can see Emerson saying to Coleridge, basically, um, you have no power because your God is dead. 
All right. On that note, <laughs> I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>